So I'm willing to bet that most of you probably have a rough understanding of how a manual gearbox works, whether we're talking about a gearbox in a car or even a lathe. As in, the power goes through the input shaft, through to one gear, to the next, and then through to the output shaft. If we have a big input gear and a small output gear, we'll get more speed at the output. And if we have a small input gear and a large output gear, we'll get more mechanical advantage at the output. Now of course real world gearboxes are usually a bit more complicated than that, but that is the general idea of how they work. However with automatic gearboxes, and I do mean true automatic gearboxes, so not DSG or CVTs, but old school automatics, they can be a real headache to understand just how they work. Because unlike a manual gearbox where the flow of power is generally quite straightforward to understand, automatic gearboxes are a complex mess of planetary drives and clutches, especially modern ones with 6, 7 or even 8 different speeds. However, the basic principles behind how these things actually work is not as complicated as you may initially think, and it's remained pretty consistent for over half a century. And in this video, my aim is to explain how these things work. So what I have here is a demonstration model of an automatic gearbox that I built over the past few months. And whilst I have made some slight changes compared to what you would find in a car, the mechanical underpinnings and the flow of the power are exactly the same. In fact, the design itself is really just an amalgamation of several gearbox designs that you might find in many American cars from the mid to the late 20th century. More specifically, a 3-speed automatic plus reverse. I've never driven one and the number of gears does feel a bit low, but I do know that these gearboxes do exist. Now some people did point out in the previous video, this gearbox does share a lot of similarities with a Simpson gear set. And if you really wanted to, you could probably call it that, although the general layout and how everything connects together is a bit different compared to a true Simpson gearbox. So for the purpose of this video, I'm just going to call it a 3-speed automatic plus reverse. And I think the important thing is though, even though this is only a 3 speed, once you understand how this works, understanding how a 4, 5 or a 6 speed works becomes a lot easier to do. And in my opinion, I think seeing this as a physical mechanical model will be a lot easier to understand than a 2D drawing or a 3D animation. So with all that said, let's get started. So first things first, let's go over everything on the gearbox. So starting at the back, we have our input shaft, which connects to a handle, or in the real world, this will be connected to an engine or a motor. Next up, we have a clutch, which is keyed to the input shaft, which allows it to drive it. And by sliding it forward, it's able to connect to the housing of the first planetary gear set. Now in a proper gearbox, the clutch design would be different, but they would be able to achieve the exact same thing. Moving up, we then have a second clutch, which in this case is a coupler, which connects the input shaft to our main or our middle shaft. Moving forward, we then have our two planetary gear sets. Now for simplicity, they both share the exact same number of teeth, but this doesn't always need to be the case, and the number of teeth would generally be decided by the gearing needed. And finally, we have our output shaft. Although technically, because this is a display model, I didn't feel the need to make it. But if this was a proper gearbox, what you'd have is an output shaft that would be driven off the planet carrier of the second gear set. But because I don't have one, every time I refer to the output, we'll be referring to the speed or the RPM of the planet carrier. And also not added, each gear housing can be held stationary by a clutch or a brake. And because I didn't add it, I'll be using some blue tack to hold it in place, which will achieve the exact same effect. And if we compare this with a proper gearbox, there's our planetary drives, just a lot more of them. There are the clutches, and then there's the output and the input shaft. As a bit of a side note, I think it's a common misconception that because automatic gearboxes don't have a clutch pedal, and use a torque converter instead, that they don't have any clutches. In reality, they have more clutches than a manual gearbox, they're just located elsewhere, doing different things, and they're operated automatically. Now all of this is able to work because of the planetary gear set. If you haven't seen my previous video on them, they work so well in gearboxes because they're strong, relatively compact, and the axis of input and the output remain concentric, along the same axis. But also the way that they're able to achieve their gear ratios is probably the most important factor here. Because unlike connecting two spur gears together, where you have two possible ratios, i.e. the input and the output, plus the inverse of that, 
With a planetary gear set, you can get a crazy number of gear ratios from them. Now the most straightforward setup would be to have one stationary gear, one input gear and one output gear in any combination from the ring, the planet slash carrier and the sun gear. And in total that would give you six different ratios. However if you drive the sun and the ring gear whilst leaving the planet gear as the output, the sky is kind of the limit for the output ratio because it will affect the rotational speed of the planet carrier. It's also worth knowing that depending on the input and the output combination, you'll get either a speed increase or decrease, which is to be expected, but also the direction of the output may also flip. So for example, if the input is the sun gear, the planet is the output and the ring gear is held stationary, we'll get a 3 to 1 speed reduction with this gear set, and the direction of the output will be the same as the input. However, if we make the carrier stationary, make the ring gear our input and the sun gear our output, we now get a 1 to 2 speed increase and the direction of the output has flipped. And trust me, this will be important later on. With all that said, let's go back to our main model now fully assembled. Now one thing that I do want to point out is that the sun gears for both planetary sets are fixed to the main shaft and they will spin at the same rate. It's really weird the first time that you see this, but trust me, it works and it'll eventually make sense. As well as that, the planet carrier of the first gear set is connected to the housing and by extension the ring gear of the second planetary drive. This connection is permanent, but it won't always be driving the housing. And once again, that'll also make sense once you see it working. So with all that said, let's finally see how it works. And we'll begin with our first gear. This will give us our largest speed reduction and the most amount of torque when the car is stationary and we want to start moving. Now to make this work, the input shaft will be connected through the coupler or the clutch to the main shaft to allow it to spin with the input. At the same time, the housing of the front planetary gearbox is held stationary through the use of a clutch, a brake, or in this case, blue tack. No adjustments will be made to the first planetary gear set. And finally, when the power is applied, we get a very simple 3 to 1 reduction in speed and 3 times the torque at our output, which in this case is the planet carrier. So it takes 3 turns of the input to spin the output once. Now because the housing of the front ring gear is held stationary, and because it's directly connected to the planet carrier of the first, the ring gear of the first planet carrier is left to spin freely. And that is what is meant to happen. Of course though, cars do not normally spend a whole lot of time in first gear, so what we now want to do is switch into second, so we get a bit more speed at the output, but at the expense of getting a little bit less mechanical advantage. Now in a proper gearbox, the change should be done either mechanically or electronically controlled through oil pressure on the clutch plates, but here I'll be doing this manually by moving the blue tack and moving the clutches around. So to get into second, what we want to do is remove or disengage the clutch on the front ring gear and instead have it act on the first ring gear. And other than that, no other changes will be made. If we now spin the input, we can now see that we still get a 3 to 1 ratio between the sun and the planet carrier, but as well as that, the outside of the ring gear is now spinning at the same time, and that speeds up the rate that the planet carrier or our input turns. And the reason why this works is that we made the ring gear of the first planetary drive stationary, which means that the planet carrier will start to spin. And because it's directly connected to the front ring gear, the front ring gear will start to turn. And in this sort of setup, it'll turn in the same direction as the input, which means that the planet carrier will start to speed up. In effect, generating more speed at the output. And as a result of that, our gear ratio is no longer 3 to 1, or 1 to 0 0.33. It's now 3 to 1.66, or 9 to 5. So it takes 9 turns of the input to turn the output 5 times. Or to simply put it, it is faster at the output than it was before which is what you would expect from a second gear. Now to get our third gear, which in this instance is our top gear, what we want to do is connect the first clutch on the input to the back of the housing on the first planetary gear set. We'll then remove the clutch or the blue tack to let the housing spin. In this sort of arrangement, the input is now driving both the outside ring gear and the sun gear at the same time and at the same speed. And because of this, the planet ring of the first drive will spin at the same rate as the sun. 
and this gives us a one-to-one -one ratio. In turn, this drives the forward housing at the exact same rate, and because the sun gears are being driven at the same RPM, the front planet carrier will also spin at the same RPM, which is a one-to-one -one ratio. Of course though, a car wouldn't be a proper car if it didn't have a reverse gear, which can also be achieved with this sort of setup. Now to get reverse, what we need to do is disengage the clutch sleeve slash coupler from the main shaft. At the same time, we also need to engage the clutch or the brake on the front planetary ring to make it stationary. Now as you can probably see in this setup, the input now drives the first planetary set's ring gear. The power then passes through the stationary planet carrier and through to the sun gear, where the speed is doubled and more importantly, the direction is reversed. If you're a bit confused about this, think back to our previous example using the single planetary set. We're getting a 1 to 2 speed increase and a change in direction. It then travels through to the next planetary gear set, where the RPM, which is now doubled, then gets a 3 to 1 reduction, but no direction change at the output. The final result at the output will give us our reverse direction in relation to the input and an output ratio of 3 to 2. As you can see, using only two planetary gearboxes and four clutch combinations, we've been able to achieve our first, second and third forward gears plus our one reverse gear. And this would have been the basic setup found in many three-speed automatic transmissions for the main reason that they were cheap, simple, and adequate for the task. Of course though, this is only a 3-speed transmission, and most cars outside of the Americas would have had a 4, 5, or a 6-speed transmission. But really, once you understand how a 3-speed works, it's very easy to understand how a 4, 5, or a 6 works. And really, the only big difference between them are additional planetary sets. And they work in pretty much the exact same way as we got second gear, joining the carry of one to the ring gear of the next. And by stacking them, the RPM on the front ring gear can be sped up, which will increase the speed at the output or the planet carrier. The biggest difference though with these additional banks is that whilst they will have a sun gear, they won't be connected to the main shaft. You only need two sun gears to be driven. And in fact, if we look at the gearbox that has been cut away, we can see that whilst there is a sun gear for the additional planetary drives, they're not actually connected to the main shaft, which stops short and does not go the whole length of the gearbox. The biggest reason why you'd want these extra gears is just to fill in the extra space, so to speak, left by the lack of gears in our three speed. Because with this gearbox, going from second to third is a pretty big jump, and it could really do with another gear ratio or two in between them. It just kind of feels like if this was connected to an engine, you'd be either revving the nuts off the engine, or the RPM would be too low and you're not developing enough power. On a final note, I do want to stress that in the real world, the exact layout and how each engineer and company will do their gearboxes will vary to some degree. And of course, the clutch design on a proper gearbox would all be done using proper clutch plates rather than blue tack and, you know, a keyed shaft like what you see here. However, as far as basic principles goes and the flow of power goes, pretty much all automatic gearboxes work like this and they have done for well over half a century whether they be a 3-speed or an 8-speed. Also, does anyone feel kind of crazy that you can have an 8-speed gearbox? No, only me? Ah, never mind. Anywho, I hope this one cleaned up the inner workings of how a 3-speed gearbox works. Hopefully helps you understand how a 4, 5 and 6-speed gearbox also work. Again, I'm not disparaging the textbooks or those animated videos, which I'm sure take a lot of time to animate, but I think having a physical model that you can interact with really cannot be beaten. And outside of that, thank you very much for all the support with the Planetary Gearbox series. It's been a long time in the making, but I've had a lot of fun trying to get this thing to work. And with that, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one, and I'll see you next week.